If you guys watch my two previous videos, you guys know that I've also been learning Affinity, similar to some of you guys that are watching this video right now. But it's been a while since I've been using it full time, and I'm going to show you guys 10 different things that's really, really helped me out to up my game in Affinity. These are not basic stuff, but things that actually change the way you work and the way you think in Affinity. And trust me, the last one is literally going to save your sanity sometime in the future. So stick around for that, but let's get started. If you ever drag the layer in Affinity and it's doing something funky, you don't know if it's a mask or a clip, well, let me help you out with that. So I'm gonna create two different shapes on this page. What better time is there to show off the cat tool in our shape building? Um, so I'm gonna make two different cats and one is going to be a red little cat and the other one is going to be a blue little cat. You can see them in the actual layer itself. I have the red cat on top and what I'm gonna do is in the layer tab, I'm going to drag it on top of the blue cat. So what that's gonna do is it's going to clip the red cat into the blue cat. In the same vein, if we drag this red cat onto the blue cat, but instead of onto the layer, we drag it onto the icon, you can see that it's actually going to use it as a mask to clip out the blue cat. These two just make it really fast for you to do clips and masks. And how I like to personally think about it is that whatever layer you're dragging into is going to be the frame of that image. You guys can see that if I have a cat and I place it where I want the clip to be, and I drag the picture layer into the cat as if I want that to be the frame, it basically does the clip super fast and super easy. This is something that is absolutely an upgrade and you absolutely must know. When I learned this one, it absolutely blew my mind, but you don't actually need to go into Photoshop to edit your images to make cool effects. So a lot of times when we have images like the one I have on the screen on the left, we wanna take out the background and have something else go in there and clip out the subject or the object. The good news about that is it's all in one app and we can do this natively. So if I go in and switch to Pixel, and I go into my selection tool. So let's say I use my selection brush tool. And on this image, I'm going to paint all of the areas that are dark. You can see that it's done a pretty good job of actually selecting all the dark parts. I can go up to refine. And similar to how this works in Photoshop, you can adjust things like smooth, feather, as well as the border. I'm going to go ahead and output this into a mask and apply that mask. So right now the mask is on the top of everything. We're going to use what we just learned from tip number one and drag it into the icon of the bottom image, which is my actual image on the left here. You can see it erase the background. And if I go back into my layout studio and I add some text in the background like this, let's say we fill it with some placeholder text. I drag my filler text all the way down underneath my image. You can see that the image is on top of the text and the text is basically in that white space. Now to save you guys an extra step when you're doing this, I actually figured out that all the hotkeys stay the same as you're in this app. So if I know that the hotkey for selection tool is W, I can actually stay in layout and then press W. Maybe you have to do it once or twice, but the same selection tool will come out. The same refine tool will come out. So super handy and easy if you just know all of your shortcut keys. Okay, this next one is a massive time saver, especially if you have a giant file with a bunch of stuff in it. And I'm talking about selections. So selecting is super easy in Affinity. And basically what you have to do is go into layer, select, and we have same as well as layer. So in layer, you can select everything that is an object uh, that has these attributes. So for example, if I select every layer that has curves in it, it's going to select every layer that has curves in it. You can see that I can adjust all of these different curves. Now on the same vein, we can go ahead and use layer, select, and we have to have something selected for this. So let's do something like this element on the top left here. So if I go into the same selection tool and I just select something like fill color, it's going to select everything on this page that has the same attribute as the element that I have selected. So if I go ahead and edit this, you can see that all the elements that it's selected has the same fill. Now, the one interesting thing here that you can do, I think is really cool, is if you go and hover over this where it says transform objects separately, you can actually see that all of these objects will stay in their relative positions and you can adjust them separately, but together. Just makes it super fast to select what you want and leave what you don't need untouched. 
Okay, quick break. If you work with the PDFs a lot, this sponsor will be really useful. This video is sponsored by UPDF, which is a modern cross-platform PDF editor that's designed to replace a bunch of clunky PDF workflows with one clean app. The first thing I like is that you can edit text, images, and links directly inside of PDF. No converting, no round trip file, and you just click and change it. You can also convert PDFs to other formats like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, HTML, or my favorite, images. If you're working with longer PDFs, UPDF make it easier to reorder, delete, insert, or extract pages. So reorganizing it is a breeze. It also has AI features built in. You can do things like summarize PDF, translate them, and ask questions about the content, which is surprisingly useful for things like reports or research papers. UPDF works on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android, and one license works across multiple devices. So I've got a link in the description for all of you folks if you want to check it out. And now back into the video. If snapping feels random or annoying, it might be because you don't have enough snaps checked on, or maybe you don't have enough checked off. So in order for us to change our snap setting, you have to go up here to the top where it says snapping, and then you can enable or disable snap right up here on the top. It's also split into different sections like page snapping and object snapping where you can turn them on and off. But for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to go and check on absolutely everything. And it's going to basically give us some very nice snaps as well as different dialogues that come up. So whenever I go ahead and drag this around, different snaps are going to pop up. And something that I thought was really cool is that these little numbers pop up in the actual guides themselves. And as you move them, they change. So play around with this one and probably don't turn every single one of them on and let me know what you think. This is how you stop manually fixing alignment and let Affinity take care of consistency for you. And that's it, I'm talking about master pages. So if we go over here to the left where it says master pages, I'll go into my A parent page. And in order to start a guide, we have to go into view and turn on our guides. So here you can see that on the left and on the right, there's two different things. On the right, we can adjust our different columns as well as our rows. I'm gonna turn off preview so we can actually see the guides. But the cool thing is you can change it between outline as well as filled guides. And you can also change the color of whatever it is that you choose. You can change the margins. If you want all of these to go all the way out to the page, all you have to do is change this to zero. And you can see that the page will change all the margins in the background to the outside of the page. I'm gonna keep it on my margin at 0.5. So if you go and look to the left side, you can actually create horizontal guides and you can check on percentage. So for example, if I create a 50% guide, it's gonna be halfway across my page. If I create something like a 25%, a quarter of the way, and then 75%, it's going to be three quarters of the way. You get the point. You can also change the color of these guides to whatever you think makes sense. And the flexibility really, really helps in making your layout shine. So what's even the point of using frames in Affinity? Well, let me show you. So here I'm going to drag an image in on the right. And on the left, I'm going to create a frame first that's approximately the same size as this image. And then I'm going to drag the image in. These two are going to behave really, really differently. For example, if I scale this, you can see that this is kind of what you would expect. But if I scale this frame, it's actually going to adjust the image based on what I have inside the actual frame itself. Similarly, you might run into problems where this will basically stretch rather than scale proportionally. Whereas if I want to do the same thing on the one with the frame, it's going to still scale proportionally. Okay, that aside, it's very important for us to understand image fitting. Now in InDesign, it's fairly simple to reach. It's also simple in Affinity, but the name has changed a tiny bit. So if we right click on the image and we go into frame properties, the same scale to max fit, scale to minimum fit, as well as stretch will all be in that same option. Now, one thing that I thought was really cool is if you check on anchor to center, it's going to try its best to preserve the center of the image no matter how you scale this actual frame itself. If you ever had to hunt down a color or a swatch across document, Affinity can help you with that with swatches as well as document colors. So here on the screen, I have all of my brand colors. 
And what we're going to do is turn on the swatch panel. So we go up to window, general, and we're going to turn on swatches. So we're going to see this little pop up here and you're going to see a bunch of colors in the swatches, similar to how you would find it in any other program. But I just want to say that what we can do here is we can actually turn on hatches, which is so crazy to me because I've always had to go back into Illustrator in order to actually use hatches, but now I can actually use it in a layout program, which is great. Anyways, what we want to do is go down to this drop down menu and then we can go ahead and create palette from document. There's two options that it gives you one as an application palette and one as a document palette. And what that basically means is if you create it as a application palette, you can use it across all of the different applications and all the different files that you have open right now. Whereas if you create it as a document palette, it's going to only work in your current document. So if I go ahead and create as an application palette, it'll basically create a palette with all the colors that I have on this entire page. Now you can see that if I navigate to my other design document, and I go into swatches, I can actually navigate to the palette that we just created and use this to change the color of anything I want on this page. Now, keep in mind guys, that when you create something like this, it's gonna sample all of the colors on your page. So if you have pictures or anything like that, it's also going to take those colors. So here I've created a palette from this page that you're seeing on your screen and look how many different shades of gray it gave me. So just be aware of that when you're creating something like this. Most people don't realize this, but you can actually use adjustment layers like you do in Photoshop straight in the layout workspace. So here I have my image and so many times I wanted to turn something like this black and white. So what you can do is go underneath the layer tab and under right here, it actually has adjustments. So I'm gonna click on that and here you can see all the different options that you can play with. I'm gonna go with black and white and I can do the slider exactly how you would expect something like this to come out. And once I feel comfortable with that, I can go ahead and close it and the effects is already applied to my image. I can actually drag this layer onto the image itself for it to be a mask. And similar to the actual adjustment layers, I can also add things like effects, which we'll see down here, and things like outer shadow, as well as all the other stuff that you see here. So if I add an outer shadow, you can already see that it's being applied to my picture right here. Again, natively in the layout workspace. This one's more personal because I wish I knew about this when I first started, it would have saved me so much time, but it's toolbar customization. There's so many tools that I want and I can't find them. So here, all we have to do is go into our view and then scroll down to customize toolbar. It's gonna bring up all of these different things that you can add. So for example, if I want to add something like a artboard tool over on the left here, I can do that. You can even keep it clean with the separator so you can separate all the sections, which I thought was super amazing. Uh, and then here in the toolbar, let's say I wanna add something like a text wrap, which I use a lot. I can go up here and search text wrap and then it'll basically pull that up and then I can drag this all the way to the top here and if I close this, I can click on this quick selection from my toolbar and it'll bring up the text wrap panel. Okay, okay, now on to the last tip. This one doesn't necessarily make you faster, but it's going to save your project one day. And I'm talking about autosave. Now, Affinity doesn't really have autosave, it has auto recover. The difference is when your Affinity crashes and you open it up again, it's going to bring it back where it actually is. I do find that the save interval for that is fairly long, so let's change that. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go into edit, go down into setting, and by default, I believe it's 300 seconds for your file recovery interval. I'm gonna go ahead and change that to something like three minutes just to have that better peace of mind, and I'm going to close that up. Because it doesn't have autosave, I can't stress this enough, but if you look at your document top side right here, where it says the name and on beside it, it says modify, that means you haven't saved. So make sure you press command save, control save, whatever you need. And you can see as soon as I do that, that modified goes away. So without auto save, make sure you guys are manually saving uh, or we can rely on the auto recover. But I've always wondered what happens if your computer just literally shuts down, like your power cuts off. Does it still work? You guys let me know. And that's it. That's all 10 of the tips that helped me out that I really hope will help you guys out too. If you guys enjoyed, hit that subscribe button because we're so close to 100K. Like and share with your friends. And with that said, 
I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.